Amen. All right, we're in the book of James, so go ahead and flip over there. James chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 4. I broke out my old Bible this morning. Um, it is uh, it is one that I used. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, this is the one that I was given. Let's see. Yep, this was my ordination service, May the 21st, 1995. And uh, I used this for a long time, and it got uh, kind of bulky, and I got a smaller one. But, uh, but anyway, all right. Um, James chapter 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. Beginning in verse 1, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James penned these words. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various or divers temptations, various temptations or trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing." When you think about the book of James, the first question is is this, who is James? And uh, James, who is called the brother of Jesus, uh, although the first definite connection of him in this letter does not emerge until a little bit later in the actually the first century, I'm sorry, the first half of the third century, uh, it is to him has always been traditionally ascribed. Um, the Roman Catholic Church even agrees with this ascription. Because in 1946, at the Council of Trent, they laid it down that James is can, uh, can, can, canonical, excuse me, uh, and is uh, written by an apostle. In other words, this is uh, definitely uh, through the inspiration of the Lord. Um, James grew up with Jesus. Now, what do you think about this? James, the brother of Jesus, grew up with him. I cannot imagine. You know, obviously, I don't know that James understood Jesus was exactly who he said he was until the resurrection. But think about growing up with a brother that was perfect. Uh, that, to me, would be <laughs> very difficult. Uh, would be kind of a hard thing to deal with. Um, you know, because I would imagine that mom and dad are always saying, "If only you were like your brother," especially at being Jesus, uh, being perfect. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, James grew up with Jesus. And uh, But with Acts, there comes a sudden and unexplained change. When Acts opens up, Jesus' mother and his brothers are there with a little group of Christians in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. From there, it becomes clear that James has become a leader of the Jerusalem church. Although how it came to be is not really explained, but uh, it is to James that Peter sends the news uh, of his escape from prison in Acts chapter 12. Verse 17, James presides over the council of Jerusalem, which, um, which agreed to the entry of the Gentiles into the Christian church. By the way, do you know who was the apostle to the Gentiles? Anybody want to take a guess? Who was the apostle to the Gentiles? Paul. It was Paul. Very good. Um, but it is James and Peter whom Paul meets when he first goes to Jerusalem and it is with Peter, James, and John, who are the pillars of the church, that he discusses and settles uh, the sphere of his work. This is in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, and Galatians chapter 2, and verse 9. But it is to James that Paul comes with his collection from the Gentile churches on his visit to Jerusalem, which is destined to be his last and which leads to his imprisonment in Acts chapter 21. Uh, this, this last episode is important because it shows uh, that James very, is very sympathetic to, to the Jews uh, who observe the Jewish law and is eager that their uh, scruples should not be offended. In other words, um, he, James is wanting to make sure that you don't offend the Jews uh, with what's going on. He actually persuades Paul to demonstrate his loyalty to the law by assuming responsibility for the expenses of certain Jews who are fulfilling the Nazarite uh, vows. Um, so who was James in the early church? Plainly, James was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. As might, you might expect, this was something that uh, tradition greatly developed. Which tradition greatly developed? Uh, 
um, an early historian called uh, Hegesippus, I can't even pronounce that name, said that James was the first bishop of the church at Jerusalem. Uh, Clement of Alexander goes on further and says that he was chosen for the office by Peter and John. And um, so he was definitely uh, the leader of the church at Jerusalem. Uh, and so, um, matter of fact, uh, Clement of Alexandria relates uh, this about James. It says, To James the just and John and Peter, after the resurrection, the Lord committed knowledge. They committed it to the other apostles and the other apostles to the 70. Then later, developments are not uh, to be accepted, but basic fact remains that James was undisputed, the undisputed head of the church at Jerusalem. Um, How did James describe himself in verse 1? Look at verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the other New Testament writers echoed Paul's heartfelt devotion to the Lord. James did not boast about being Jesus' half-brother, but instead he called himself James, a servant, literally a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Later on in the letter, James instructed his leaders with the very familiar words, Come now, who you say, today or tomorrow will go into such a city and spend there a year and engage in business and make a profit. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we will live here, we will do this or we will do that. That's in James chapter 4, verses 13 and 15. But the language draws heavenly on this slave-master relationship. Now, obviously Jesus... If James is Jesus' slave, is God's slave, then what does that what what does that really tell you about James? What does that tell you? Total unreserved devotion. It is if the Lord will, I'm going to do this. If the Lord doesn't will, I'm not going to do this. Everything about James was I am his slave, I am his servant, I am going to do everything I can. Uh, for the Lord and, and, and uh, with His strength. In our, our version, it described Him as a bond servant. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Um, so in other words, he everything He did, He wanted to do to please God. Now, I think that that says something to us because the truth is, if we are in Christ, then we are a slave. We are a servant to Christ. And uh, we need to always recognize that because I think sometimes... We let pride creep in and we think, I'm a Christian. Man, look at me. The truth of the matter is, we are nothing without Christ. And, um, and only by His grace, we are who we are. And, uh, and we are His servant. We're His slave. Uh, we, w- we ought to be willing to do anything He wants us to do, to go anywhere He wants us to go. And you know, thinking about the apostles, the early disciples, man, these, these folks had it pretty rough. You and I, we, we are very at ease compared to what they were going through. All of them ended up um, suffering for Christ in countless measures of suffering. Think about the Apostle Paul. I mean, and listen, he counted it great. I mean, it was an awesome thing to him that he was able to suffer for Christ. And so he was, James was described as a slave to Jesus. And certainly um, it is a servant uh, or he was a servant or a slave of Christ. So what difference did that make? Um, a Scottish pastor named Alexander McLaren, who was a contemporary of, uh, of Spurgeon, echoed this, these same truths. And he said this, The true position then for a man is to be God's slave. Absolute submission, absolute unconditional obedience on a slave's part, and on, on the part of the master, complete that ownership. To the right of life and death, the right of, of disposing of all goods and chattels. Uh, in other words, everything that you have belongs to God. That's what he's trying to say here. The right of issuing command without reason. The right to expect that those commands shall be swiftly, unhesitatingly, punctiliously, and completely performed. That is, if you are a slave of God, a slave of Jesus Christ... Whatever he says, immediately, it was the job of a slave for the owner, for the slave to immediately do what he was told to do. And if we read in God's Word, this is the way you're to live, this is the way you're not to live, we need to abide by it. Because we are a slave of Christ. We are a servant 
of Christ. And, um, and then uh, he said this, Alexander McLaren said this, For brethren, such submission, absolute and unconditional, uh, the blending of the absorption of my own will in his will, uh, is the secret of all that makes manhood glorious and great and happy. You see, the problem today is that many people view this thing of submission to Christ, this thing about being a slave to Christ, they think, man, I don't have any freedom. But folks, God made us to follow Him. And the only way we're going to be complete, and the only way we're going to be happy, is if we're submitting ourselves to God. And, and the thing is, God sets boundaries for us. But it's not to spoil our fun. The boundaries that God sets for us is good for us. And if we follow what God wants, man, we're complete and we're happy. But it's when we're out there in left field. Wait a minute. That's left field to y'all. This is left field to me. When you're out there in left field and you know you're not following the will of God and you know you're not being the servant of God that you ought to be, you're miserable. I cannot tell you how many Christians that I know that are not completely following the Lord's will and they're kind of in between. And man, they are miserable. They are just miserable. So if you want to be complete, give this unconditional surrender of your life to the Lord. And you know, I remember growing up, one of the things that I love to say, and I did this for a long time until I got to a certain age of maturity, but I remember my friends in, in school, elementary school all the way up to probably middle school, I remember they would say something like, hey, let's go do this or let's go do that. And you know what I said? I can't do that. You know why I can't do that? Because my mom and dad said I couldn't do that. Folks, God said, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. And if we simply follow what His will is for our lives, man, we're not only pleasing to Him, but we're staying out of a whole lot of trouble too. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so it's important that we follow His will. We are His servant. We are His bond servant, if you will. <laughs> Who was the letter the book of James written to? Uh, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. That is, the Jews scattering... Um, this was in 722 B.C. when the Assyrians deported the ten northern tribes. And so this was those Jews who were scattered abroad. Um, later, the, the southern tribes suffered the same fate when the Babylonians took them captive, if you remember that. Uh, that was in 586 B.C. Um, because of this, the Jews were spread all over Mesopotamia and around the Mediterranean and to Asia Minor and Europe. You find that in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, and also verses 9 through 11. Some of the major cities in the world, Alexander, for example, had a large population of expatriate Jews. Um, also, when Jewish Christians were first persecuted in Jerusalem after the death of Stephen, they fled first to Judea uh, and Samaria. That's in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And then to the Jewish community around the Mediterranean, Acts chapter 11, 19 and 20. Tragically, these Jewish Christians were not taken in by their expat expatriate Jewish kinsmen, but rather were rejected and persecuted uh, because of this. Uh, further refused protection by the Jewish community, these Jewish Christians that were scattered abroad were exploited by the Gentiles. Homeless, disenfranchised, they were robbed of what possessions they had, they were hauled into court, subjected to, to the Gentile elite. Uh, they had less standing than a slave. So this letter was written to some people that were in pretty rough shape. And, um, but it, it's interesting because James said in verse 2, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various or divers or various trials or temptations, knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience. So it, it really means a whole lot when you see where these, Jew, or these Jewish Christians were. They were dejected. They were the lowest of the low people. And yet James is trying to encourage them. Count it all joy when you go through these trials because it is working for your good. It's working for this patience. And... Um, it said, but patient, verse 4, but patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect, entire, lacking nothing. What did James teach us that we can expect in following Christ? I know that the letter was written to these uh, Jewish Christians. But folks, the Word of God is timeless in its um, truths. It's timeless in its... Um, um, the way that, that God's Word is carried out. So what did James teach us that we can expect in following Christ? 
trials and tests that will lead to that patience. Every one of us, from time to time, will face some kind of trial or some kind of temptation, uh, some kind of test. Trials and tests come that impact our patience and give it a chance to grow, that give us a chance to grow. As patience begins to develop, strong character is cultivated, moving us ever onward toward maturity as a Christian. And I think sometimes we look at trials the way we shouldn't look at them. We look at them as, man, poor me, look what I'm having to go through. I mean, that's, you know, that's nature. That's, that's what we want to do sometimes. But God is working in us to produce in us this spiritual maturity that can only happen as we go through these trials and these tests. That is exactly what He is trying to produce in us. And folks, I'm going to tell you, personally, going through what we're going through now, I can attest to that fact. And I can also tell you this, that God's grace is sufficient. It is. Uh, not just for myself, but for Tina, and not just for us, but God's grace is sufficient for Miss Shirley, God's grace is sufficient for Lynn. It, it is sufficient. And it is so wonderful to see how that God works in our lives and how He brings about uh, that Christian spiritual maturity. There is no shortcut to spiritual maturity. But by refusing to squirm out of your trouble, to find yourself becoming the man or woman that you've always wanted to be in the Lord. Folks, there is nothing that can replace that. And many times, only these trials and these troubles in life will bring us to that point. You know, I'm reminded of what the Bible tells us. That God is trying to refine us. He's trying to mold us and make us. It's kind of like putting gold into the fire. And it, it, all those impurities come to the top. And that's exactly what the Lord wants to happen in our lives. As these trials and these troubles come our way, it is a way that God wants to take and use those troubles to refine us and to get those impurities out of our lives and to make us more into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. James says this, there were, there were many kinds of trials. What are some examples of trials that we experience? One of the wildest stories that we've ever seen on this subject came uh, from the insurance. This is a guy that's a pastor giving this illustration that I put down. He said, one of the wildest stories that we've ever seen on this subject came from the insurance claim form of a bricklayer who got hurt at a building site. He was trying to get a load of bricks down from the top floor of a building without asking for help from anyone else. He wrote, it would have been... Uh, it would have taken too long to carry all the bricks down by hand, so I decided to put them in a barrel and lower them down by a pulley, which I had fastened to the top of the building. After trying the rope secure, tying the rope securely at ground level, uh, I went up to the top of the building. I fastened the rope around the barrel loaded with bricks, and I swung it over the sidewalk for the descent. Then I went down uh, to the sidewalk and untied the rope, holding it securely, to, to guide the barrel down slowly, but then, but, but since I weighed only 140 pounds and the 500 pound load jerked me from the ground so fast that I didn't have time to think of letting go of the rope, I, as I passed between the second and third floors, I met the barrel coming down. This accounts for the bruises and the lacerations on my upper body. I, tightly, or I held tightly to the rope until I reached the top where my hand became jammed by the pulley. This accounts for my broken thumb. At the same time, however, the barrel hit the sidewalk with a bang and the bottom fell out. With the weight of the bricks had gone, the barrel <laughs> weighed only about 40 pounds. Thus, my 140-pound body began to swiftly descend, uh, and I met the empty barrel coming down. This accounts for my broken ankle. Slowly, uh, only slowed only slightly as I continued my descent, I landed on the pile of bricks. This accounts for my sprained back and broken collarbone. At this point, I lost my presence of mind completely, and I let go of the rope, and the empty barrel came crashing down on me. This accounts for my head injuries. Um, and as for the last question on the insurance form, what should I do if, I, if the same situation rose again? Please be advised that I'm finished trying to do that job all by myself. And then it said this, everybody needs somebody to come alongside them and help them. If you're understanding that and are willing to give to others and help them maintain the right motive, uh, their lives and yours can be changed. Now, I said that to say this, James in this passage is trying to encourage these believers who have just gone through this terrible ordeal and are going through this terrible ordeal. And I thought it's so fitting 
James is encouraging them, and the Bible tells us that we are to encourage one another and lift one another up. And folks, as you see your brother or sister in Christ going through, it's not just, hey, I'm praying for you. It is, what can I do to help you? You see, words are cheap. We can say things and, you know, and mean them in our heart, but those words have got to be followed up by action. I love you enough that, hey, I'm going to put forth effort to do what I can for you. And so it's just a really important thing that we, we exercise this faith as we encourage each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and we lift one another up. Now, as we today face these trials and these troubles in life, we can be encouraged because not only is the Lord going to take what is going on in our life and use it to conform us more to the image of our Lord and Savior, but man, I love the fact that I've got brothers and sisters in Christ just like you and that we can encourage one another and lift one another up in our faith. And so I trust, uh, by the way, I'll I'll just give this a a personal example. Um, Considering what's been going on uh, in in my family's life, um, and and even in the last year and a half to two years, my church family has been a blessing. Um, Just, you know, really been there for us. Uh, Letters and cards like you would not believe uh, that's been coming in. And people, you know, sending flowers and sending gifts and stuff like that. Uh, Just what a blessing and what an uplifting thing it is for us. Um, But you know what, folks? It's not just for the preacher. It is for all of us. We ought to all get in there together and encourage one another and lift one another up. Uh, Whether you're the preacher or the person that sits on the last pew back there, we are all the family of God. And we are all to encourage one another and lift one another up. And... um, And so I appreciate all that you have done for us. And, um, you know, I I know this too, that the Bible says that we're to rejoice when trials come. Why? Because the trial of your faith worketh patience. And uh, and that is is what we want. Whether it comes by trial or whether it comes by anything else, we want that spiritual maturity in our lives. At least we should want it. And and I know that you folks do. Um, So may God help us. Uh, to recognize that this life does hold trials and it does hold tests, and but God wants to produce His work and His will in our lives if we'll simply let Him. Not to get bitter through trials, but simply to say, God, I'm going to let You work Your will and Your way in my life through these things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You today for the example in Your Word. Lord, what these Jewish Christians must have been going through uh, is just horrendous. And Lord, we recognize today that all of us uh, face trials and troubles and tests and so forth. Lord, man is born a few days and full of trouble. And Lord, the truth of the matter is, um, we do face troubles, we do face tests, we do face trials. But Lord, what you want to produce in us is something beautiful and something wonderful if we'll simply let you. If we'll simply not be bitter, but Lord, simply trust you and know that you are working Uh, something good out for us. Uh, Lord, I know that uh, the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, but we know that all things work together for the good of them that are called according to your purpose. And Lord, we know that uh, as we face these tests, as we face these troubles and trials, Lord, we know that you're right there with us side by side. And Lord, we know that our faith and trust is in you. But Lord, we also know that we've got wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ uh, who are there for us as well. And we thank you and praise you for your love, your goodness, your grace. And Lord, I pray uh, today that you would just encourage us and strengthen us in the Lord. We thank you for the time, for a few minutes we've had together this morning. And Lord, what a wonderful time it is, even in the middle of uh, after Sunday school and even after the service, to be able to fellowship and to be able to talk with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you that it's a day that you've made and we rejoice and we're glad in it. And Lord, we're looking forward to what you have for us as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Isn't it in 2 Peter?